Thank you very much for coming to the second annual Humanitas Economic Thought Lecture to be given by Professor Stanley Fisher. I am Vincent Crawford, the Drummond Professor of Political Economy, and I'm All Souls College's Academic Director for the Visiting Professorships in Economic Thought. And the Humanitas program is a series of visiting professorships at Oxford and Cambridge whose goal is to bring leading scholars and practitioners to both universities to address major themes in the arts, social sciences, and humanities. Created by Lord Weidenfeld, who's here with us tonight, um, the program is managed and funded by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. Uh, Oxford's part's a collaboration with the diminished Division of Humanities, and Oxford's economic thought professorships are funded by the generous support of Dr. Donald Marin and run in collaboration with All Souls College. I also want to thank Claire Oxenberry and Louise Randall of the Humanities Decision Division, and especially Bridget Allen of All Souls for their tireless and essential help in organizing this lecture and the workshop tomorrow. So for the Humanitas Visiting Professorships, we've sought distinguished speakers whose work illustrates both the depth of economic theory and its usefulness in thinking about policies to further human well-being. We also wished for speakers who could make the analysis accessible to a general audience, and we're especially delighted, having scoured the world, to have found a second economist who more than meets both criteria. Uh, Professor Stanley Fisher, governor of the Bank of Israel since 2005. Prior to joining the bank, Professor Fisher was vice chairman of Citigroup and president of Citigroup International. He was also the first deputy managing director of the IMF, Killian professor and head of the Department of Economics at MIT, and vice president for development economics and chief economist at the World Bank. Professor Fisher is a macroeconomic theorist of great power and depth. His many academic distinctions include fellowship of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and an honorary degree from the Hebrew University. He's also a brilliant policy analyst whose distinctions include membership of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Group of 30, and the Trilateral Commission. He is the author or co-author of numerous scholarly articles and monographs and the co-author of two of the leading textbooks in macroeconomics. I was a graduate student at MIT when Professor Fisher arrived as a faculty member in 1973, four years from completing his doctorate there. With the late Rudiger Dornbusch, he transformed the intellectual landscape of a department that already had five current or future Nobel laureates, most of them macroeconomists like himself. I'm counting Merton, yes I am. Um, <laughs> he brought macroeconomics at MIT into the post-Keynesian era while preserving its essential Keynesian insights. Much of what Ben Bernanke, Paul Krugman, Olivier Blanchard, Mario Draghi, and several other of the world's leading macroeconomists and central bankers know about their craft, they learned from Professor Fisher. Professor Fisher's topic tonight is Lessons of the Crisis, 2007 to 2012. Tomorrow's all-day workshop will continue tonight's discussion in a more specialized way with two master classes by Professor Fisher, one by Professor Sir John Vickers, the Warden of All Souls, one by Professor Hyun Shang Shin of Princeton University, and a panel decision at all three. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stanley Fisher to Oxford. Thank you uh, very much. It is a, a great uh, honor for me to uh, be giving this lecture in the presence of Lord Weidenfeld, and I'm also grateful to uh, Vince Crawford for uh, exaggerating a little bit. Um, the, uh, the best thing about MIT, uh, in addition to the faculty, was the students, and uh, each of those guys would have done it on their own, more or less, uh, without without a whole lot of uh, of leadership by the uh, by the uh, faculty, which included at the time they were students uh, Paul Samuelson, Bob Solo, Franco Modigliani, and Rudy Dornbush. So they did have a lot of people 
uh, to whom they listened and from whom uh, they learned. And among the students, but not in my field, was uh, Vince Crawford. Uh, so I am very pleased. Uh, oh, and I should mention that Donald Marin was also a student so, at MIT. So here we have an MIT-Oxford uh, uh, connection. I'm going to talk about lessons of the uh, crisis, which I've written as 2007 to 2012. Well, that's a hope, uh, not yet a, a fact. Uh, and this has gone on far longer than, uh, than was expected, even when we realized how serious a crisis this was going to be following the uh, bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers uh, in, Septem in September 2008. The, uh, at that time, we feared that we were going to go into another Great Depression. Uh, I don't think there's been a macroeconomic event of the nature of uh, what happened in the five or six months following the Lehman Brothers collapse uh, before. It didn't even happen in the Great Depression. I'll show you in a while some uh, data on the collapse of world trade, which happened almost immediately, and several other events. And uh, although nobody would have said it at the time, uh, many of those in positions of policy, in policy making positions, felt that we had a significant chance of repeating uh, an experience that we thought would never be uh, repeated. And I want to talk about why that didn't happen, what we've learned about that, and uh, I want to ask the question whether what we used to tell our students we've learned from Keynesian economics, namely how to prevent a repeat of the Great Depression, whether we should feel confident about that view uh, today in light of what has happened and in light of what we may learn uh, from this uh, crisis as we digest its lessons. I should perhaps add that uh, we, uh, uh, some of the students here may know what we will have learned from this uh, recession uh, by the end of their careers. The uh, most, one of the most important pieces of work on the Great Depression was actually done by Ben Bernanke in 1983, 50 years after the Great Depression in which he argued, and it's been important in the policy decisions the Fed has made, that what caused, what was instrumental in the depth of the Great Depression was not so much that the quantity of money stopped growing, but that the credit mechanism collapsed. And uh, if you study what Bernanke and the Fed have done, you will realize that the effort has been to restore the credit mechanism to health and not uh, solely to focus on the quantity of money. So it took 50 years of the Great Depression to work that out. I don't know how long it'll take to work out what has happened here and what was important uh, after 2012 or 14 or whenever this uh, ends. Um, what I intend to do, and I'm, I apologize for putting putting too much into this lecture, but I thought it would be useful to give you an idea of the full breadth of the issues with which we've been uh, struggling. Uh, what I would like to do is to go through three aspects of uh, policy making during this uh, crisis. Uh, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and then thirdly, the issues relating to financial stability. On both fiscal policy and monetary policy, we are essentially making generalization, strengthening uh, aspects of what was thought uh, as a result of the uh, work of Keynes. Uh, on the financial stability side, uh, we are dealing with material which was not emphasized, unfortunately, before and will be emphasized henceforth. 
Let me give uh, a few uh, facts. You all know them, and I'm going to go through them quickly uh, of what happened uh, during the, uh, during the uh, Great Recession. I'm going to move ahead fairly quickly. This is the outline of the uh, lecture. We'll talk about fiscal policy, monetary policy, financial stability. There are a few issues which I want to discuss under the heading of politi politi political economy. And then in the end, I'll ask what all this amounts to so far. Uh, this is what happened in the Great Recession of 2009 and onwards. Um, the global economy was growing pretty well up to 2008. Uh, it then, following Lehman Brothers, entered into a very serious uh, recession. Uh, you can see that growth in the uh, European Union and in the advanced economies declined from numbers in the three to four percent, uh, uh, two to three percent range to minus, uh, close to on four, minus three, minus four percent. That's a very big recession, a decline uh, of that sort. Those countries came out of the recession uh, fairly quickly. You'll see here one of the positive features of this recession, that throughout the uh, emerging market and developing economies have done better than uh, the advanced economies, and significantly so uh, during uh, this period. Most uh, remarkably, there was a globally coordinated, extremely sharp decline in the level of world trade. And uh, you see that world trade declined for all groups by somewhere between 8 and uh, 12 to 13 percent in the year 2009, having grown at somewhere around 3 or 4 percent the year before. That collapse was concentrated in the first half of 2009, and there were countries, Taiwan was one of them, some of the other East Asian countries, who saw their exports decline by 40 or 50 percent within the first five months following the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And there hasn't been anything like that uh, before. And that was the period in which uh, we were all very, very nervous. The unemployment picture is uh, somewhat more mixed. Um, for, the, uh, for the United States, which is um, green, it rose to nearly 10% and started coming down. It's now a little below 8%. Um, even Germany, uh, which is the most successful of the European countries, uh, it, came to, it, it was uh, at uh, nearly 8% in 2009. But unlike the others, it started continued declining. And that's very different than the other countries. And then uh, you have the UK. Uh, at uh, just around 8% in 2011. Now, these are very bad numbers. They are remote from what happened in the 1930s. The unemployment rate in the United States in, when President Roosevelt took office was 25%, which is the rate it is today in Spain. This is nothing like that, and higher unemployment rates were seen in the Great Depression. So in a sense, one of the uh, achievements of the policies that were followed was at least to keep unemployment uh, from rising excessively. This is not to say that it isn't a big problem. It's a very big problem, but it, uh, it um, is not the problem that we feared at the time. Now I want to talk about uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal policy and I'm sure that the students here have all studied the multiplier, the Keynesian multiplier, and know the basic facts. The multiplier is the impact of, say, an increase in government spending or an increase in government taxes or a decrease in government taxes on what happens to uh, output. And uh, there are a few features of the multiplier that simple uh, Keynesian economics, the simplest sort, 
the one that is only about the goods market will tell you that the multiplier is bigger for government spending than for taxes. Uh, and then if you go to the later chapters of the introductory textbooks where you discuss the ISLM model, uh, you learn that the multiplier is larger uh, if uh, the interest rate is held constant by the central bank and smaller if the uh, money stock is held constant. That is, multipliers are larger if the central bank accommodates the impact of fiscal policy by keeping the interest rate constant and therefore, uh, as a special case, if the interest rate is zero, if you're in the liquidity trap, fiscal multipliers are larger uh, than they would be if you were following a normal, uh, a more normal monetary policy. Those are results we already know uh, from the uh, simplest uh, Keynesian uh, economics. Well, now, what happened during this uh, period? Um, fiscal balances, that is, budget, bu budget balances, uh, budget deficits increased massively at the start of the crisis. Again, in 2009, uh, we see that for the industrialized economies, on average, the advanced economies, the budget deficit reached 9% of GDP. This is massive. Uh, it is not something which is sustainable over the long haul in almost any economy, except a rapidly growing one. And you see again that the emerging market and developing economies did not get into deficits of that size and have ended up at, with deficits on average, it's just a little below 1%, a little above 1%, uh, where, uh, oh sorry, those are forecasts. They are now at uh, just under 1%, whereas the advanced economies are at 7% on average. So what you see from these pictures, beginning to see, is that th this, unlike most crises of the interwar period, uh, of the post-war period, is a crisis which is much more pronounced among the advanced economies uh, than among the, uh, uh, the emerging market and developing uh, economies. And you see here some orders of magnitude of the deficits uh, that existed in 2011. Germany with uh, practically a balanced budget, the euro area with a much smaller budget deficit than the United States, and the large deficits being those of the UK, Japan, and, uh, and the United States. Now, when you run a, a large deficit, your debt increases. And uh, these are the current debt percentages in uh, a variety of countries, I think this is fundamentally the uh, OECD countries, but not, in, not only. And what you see here is Japan's extraordinary deficit of 230% of GDP. Uh, and then uh, Greece next with something uh, like 170, 180. A lot of deficits uh, of debt levels concentrated around 100%. Just for comparison, at the end of World War II, the debt of the United Kingdom was 300% of GDP. Uh, the debt of the United States was about 110% uh, of GDP. So we're looking here at debt levels now that are as bad as they were for some of the main com combatants in World War, uh, at the end of World War uh, II. And you can see how far away this is from average experience in the post-war period by seeing that the average experience is between the 25th and 75th uh, percentiles is in the shaded areas among the advanced economies and among the emerging economies. The debt in this crisis is way above those levels and this is the cumulative change in the gross debt uh, during that uh, period it's now increased by, on average, among the advanced economies, well above 20% of GDP. In the emerging economies, uh, it's actually uh, declining, and uh, the debt to GDP ratio. Again, a very different uh, behavior among them. Now, 
You would ask how much of this is uh, endogenous, how much of this is a policy choice, and how much of it is caused by the collapse of growth. Well, that's a complicated uh, issue. But we know that policy choices were made at several stages uh, to, uh, to increase the deficit. That was certainly made in the London summit at the end of 2008, where a pact was reached among the uh, G20 countries uh, to run expansionary fiscal policies. That is to not try to balance the budget quickly, but uh, to uh, in fact, increase uh, government spending, if reduce taxes, and I'll come back to the question of when that's possible and when it isn't. Uh, so there was a definite decision uh, not to cut, not to try to stabilize, not to try to to uh, uh, to equilibrate, to reduce the budget deficits immediately. Uh, there's a very nice paper which is summarized in the World Economic Outlook for uh, October 2012 by Olivier Blanchard, the uh, chief uh, economist, the economic counselor of the IMF, and one of his colleagues. Uh, it's box one in chapter one of, that, uh, of the World Economic Outlook. I recommend to those of you who want to follow up, taking a look at that because they calculate uh, what people thought would happen and what actually happened. Uh, and they concluded that the multipliers are much bigger, were much bigger than people had expected when they figured out what policies to undertake. Um, now, this is, uh, this is a very complicated thing to say. So let's just uh, say that countries uh, could have got to where they were, where they are now, so, sorry, would have got to where they expected to be when they started their programs with a less aggressive program of cutting budget spending from 2010 on or for increasing uh, taxes. Now, if you say that the, uh, def if the multipliers are very large or are larger than people thought when they planned, then you have to ask, what difference does it make to what you should do? Suppose I tell you that every time you raise taxes by a given amount, uh, you reduce output by some other amount, and then discover that it has twice that impact. What should you do? Uh, run tax rate, increase tax rates that by the same amount you would have? Or, as your instincts might tell you, well, if it's so effective, uh, we don't like raising taxes. If we can get the same effect by not raising taxes so much, then we wouldn't have done so much. That's probably where you think uh, you would go. In fact, um, it depends on a variety of uh, other things, including, very importantly, the question of how much does the size of the national debt matter uh, to growth and uh, to uh, the interest rate in the economy and to a variety of other things. Uh, if you have a very large <coughs> national debt and leading countries now have very large national debts by historical standards, they're all getting up towards the 100%, which is way out of the range of what was thought uh, to uh, be normal. Does that mean your growth is going to be slower in the future? Well, uh, the simple economics says, yes, if you have a lot of debt, you're going to have to pay higher interest uh, to uh, float uh, more debt, and that is negative, and that uh, tends to reduce uh, the growth rate. But there are many um, factors in whether that is the case, and uh, I won't go into them today, but that's the basic assumption. The other reason that there's a question about how fast you should try to adjust the budget is that if you don't do anything, uh, your credibility as a government that is interested in producing a stable, long-run situation for the economy is reduced. 
uh, a four-year government as in the United States, which says, yes, well, first we're going to expand the deficit for the first four years, and then in year five we'll start reducing it, uh, leads to the suspicion that they have no intention of reducing it. If people begin to suspect uh, that the government does not mean to pursue a policy of stable, uh, stable fiscal policy in which deficits eventually come down, the debt eventually goes back to more or less normal, normal levels, uh, then um, they will pay a higher interest rates and they will lose uh, in growth. So the very difficult calculus that has to be made is at what rate do I have to deal with this problem in order to persuade the markets that I am dealing with this problem and that I intend to continue dealing with it. And that's something uh, which is greatly uncertain. Um, one of the lessons uh, we learned when we worked in the IMF, and there were many crises in the 1990s, were that you could see a crisis coming. You could see it one year and you could see it the next year, and nothing would happen. And the uh, lesson we all, and then eventually it would happen. The lesson we ultimately drew was crises take much longer to develop than you expect, and then when they happen, they happen much more quickly. Uh, than you expect. And something, is sim something similar occurs, I believe, with the size of the debt. You keep worrying that it's getting too big, you see no signs of anything happening. And then one day the markets turn against you and you're in deep trouble. And that happens very quickly. So it's a threat that's out there all the time, very hard to quantify, very hard uh, to know uh, how significant uh, it is. And if the debt is on an unstable trajectory, then you're in trouble. If you look at the path of the debt and it's just ever increasing, and there is no feasible policy that the country seems able to undertake, then it will be very difficult for that country to continue getting financing from the financial markets at reasonable rates, because an unstable trajectory will explode at some stage unless policy changes and you don't know uh, whether policy will uh, change. So what we have on fiscal policy relative to Keynes is the issue of the debt. The Keynesian uh, theory does not emphasize the importance of the size of the national debt. Everything else that I've talked about is in Keynes. Uh, but this part of the debt and what is the optimal pace at which you should uh, try to uh, restore the uh, public finances to some semblance of normality. Uh, all that is a more modern development in theory. I mean, it's not in theory a more modern development. It's a more modern development that has to be done theoretically. And uh, it's important because without that, you could argue, should just run large deficits for a very long time. If the debt doesn't matter, well, that's fine. Their ex the deficit is expansionary, uh, spending more government, uh, is, the government spending more is expansionary, cutting taxes is expansionary, so just do it. Uh, but then you have to look at the uh, longer, uh, longer term consequences, and that's the difference. Of these countries, the US came closest to arguing that you should not run a, t a tightening fiscal policy at all for some time. And there were very, very powerful discussions, very uh, vigorous discussions in the uh, White House uh, and in the administration between those who said, just keep going until the situation turns around and then we can bother about the deficit versus those who said, we will lose our credibility if we don't do something now. So far, the evidence is that the U.S. is not paying a price in terms of interest rates for having undertaken this policy. I should say contrary to what I expected and to most of the, pe what most of the people I know uh, expected. But that's what's happening in the case uh, of uh, the U.S. But this fear that one day the markets will turn is a very real one. That's on fiscal policy. So we've learned that it's more powerful than we thought. 
Uh, and how do we know? Because we know what we thought in 2008, because the policies were based on what we thought. And uh, it's more powerful. Uh, it may well be that that means you need to do less fiscally at the beginning than we had thought. Uh, it does not mean that we know what to, how, uh, how to deal with the problem of the ever accumulating debt. Second issue, monetary policy. Uh, and as you know, when the crisis broke out, the uh, central banks of the leading countries cut their interest rates extremely rapidly. The Fed had already started cutting. That's the Fed in, uh, in blue there. Had already started cutting uh, before, uh, well, before Lehman Brothers because they were worried about uh, the, uh, the uh, subprime crisis in 2007 and, and the Bear Stearns uh, collapse in early 2008, and they were cutting very rapidly from five and a quarter percent. They were down to two percent well before Lehman, and then when Lehman happened, they went down to essentially zero. Uh, and that's expansionary monetary policy. Um, the Bank of Japan had been there for a long time because it's been in a uh, recession, depression, slow growth, whatever, for well over a decade, and you see its interest rate fluctuating between uh, a quarter of a percent, a half a percent, and now 0 0.1. Uh, and they're following uh, very expansionary monetary policy. Same with the BOE. Uh, here it is, came down to half a percent early in 2009 and has stuck there ever since. Uh, the Fed, by the way, says it's going to hold this rate until 2015. So that will be an extraordinarily long period of essentially a zero uh, uh, interest rate. I put Brazil up there just so that you'd see that there were some countries who were not in the same position. Brazil had high inflation and they didn't cut their interest rates uh, to uh, these low levels and they didn't have to. Inflation was pretty high in the summer of 2008. That's when the price of oil reached $147 a barrel and prices, commodity prices were rising and they took inflation with them. Uh, then when the recession started, uh, inflation fell in all countries including developing and including advanced. You see that in the advanced economies there were several months of negative inflation uh, following the uh, onset uh, of, the, uh, of the crisis. Now, is this true for all countries? It's certainly true for the UK. It's certainly true for the United States. Uh, inflation is low. Interest rates are very low. Long-term interest rates are very low. It's not true for everyone. And here we have interest rates on 10-year bonds in uh, four uh, EU country, EMU countries. Um, Germany, uh, with the 10-year interest rate, which is shown there is 1.5%. It's lower than that now. Uh, the UK, I think, is also a little, is around that level. France, somewhat higher, less uh, certain than Germany and uh, Italy and Spain significantly above. Why? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, as the uh, European Central Bank has come up with a lovely phrase which they call re-denomination risk. This is not, nothing to do with religion. Uh, this is about the fear that they will be paying off in a different currency than the euro. And uh, if so, so the re-denomination is a fear that eventually they'll get into trouble and have to leave the Eurozone. And the markets are charging those countries, uh, or were, somewhere like 7.5%, that's Spain, uh, in, uh, earlier this year. It's now come down significantly after the European Central Bank said it would do everything it could, uh, everything that was necessary to preserve uh, the euro. Now the central banks 
uh, undertook these actions by buying assets. And what we see is an unprecedented increase in the assets that are on the balance sheets of central banks. Uh, if you look at the Fed there, uh, up to the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the Fed held assets equal to about 8% of GDP of the United States, which is 15 billion, I guess that means something like, uh, 15 trillion, that means something like 1 trillion. Uh, within a few weeks after that, they'd gone up, they'd essentially more than doubled. They're at 17 and a half percent. They bought a trillion dollars worth of assets in about uh, a period of less than a month. They bought eight, seven or eight percent of GDP, just went into the markets and bought. Why? Because the markets were collapsing and you had to inject liquidity to stop this collapse. This is the Bernanke lesson on you can't let the credit mechanism joining savers and borrowers, you can't let that uh, collapse. You see the ECB started with more assets as a share of GDP, uh, for a long time was more or less uh, around the level of the uh, Fed as a share of GDP, and then recently uh, has started buying on a very massive uh, scale. Uh, this is uh, enabling, it's buying short term uh, assets of uh, governments in the European uh, Union, and its new policy is, uh, under certain conditions, a willingness to buy long-term assets. Now, I thought these numbers were, were very uh, large. 30% of GDP, of European GDP, well, European GDP is slightly larger than, oh, this is EMU, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's slightly less than the United States, but 30% of, say, uh, 11 or 12 billion is uh, 3 or 4 billion, and uh, that's a lot, uh, 3 or 4 trillion. That's a lot to have had when earlier that number was about 1 trillion. Uh, so they've been buying on an incredible scale. But here is the winner. Uh, Switzerland, the home of monetary stability. Um, in 2007, the Swiss National Bank held 17% of GDP on its balance sheet. It actually holds 90% now. This is the most rapid rate of purchase uh, that I've seen uh, anywhere. That means that they have bought, uh, let's start at a nice point. Here, they announced that they're gonna fix the uh, Swiss franc at one euro, uh, so they fixed the euro at one, tw one Swiss franc 20 and they would buy however much they had to buy to keep it at that level, because money was pouring into Switzerland, and they didn't want the exchange rate to appreciate. Well, they had to buy 30% of GDP in about four months. Um, Swiss GDP is about uh, $500 billion. So they bought uh, $150 billion in, in a few months. Uh, this is an unimaginable scale. Why do they have to do it? The fear of the collapse of the euro was leading everybody in the countries around to push their money into Switzerland because uh, you can rely on Switzerland to maintain low inflation. The Swiss franc will always be looked after. It always has been um, and so forth. And as they were doing that, the Swiss franc kept appreciating and Switzerland is a major exporter and at some point they said enough. We'll do, they didn't say what Mario Draghi said, we'll do whatever it takes. But the policy they announced is to do whatever it takes to keep uh, the Swiss franc from appreciating like that. Well, those are things that have happened. Now let's talk about what uh, we, learned, uh, we learned from them. They're all related to the collapse of confidence in, uh, in the uh, major economies and in the uh, banking systems, the major economies. What did we learn from Keynes? We learned from him that in the liquidity trap, namely when the interest rate hits zero, monetary policy becomes ineffective because there's nothing more you can do. And that's something that uh, you've all learned, all of you who are undergraduates here or are undergraduates here, 
That's something we all know. But what we've learned is that that isn't true. When the interest rate is zero, there are many things central banks can do. Uh, the uh, Fed, seeing the commercial paper market, which is a market, short-term market in which firms finance their short-term needs, collapsed in the United States. There's a less loss of confidence in anybody's credit following Lehman Brothers. The Fed went in and started buying commercial paper on a massive scale to restore that market to operation, and they succeeded. Later, uh, the mortgage markets, or for some time the mortgage markets have been in difficulty. The Fed got in there and has started buying mortgages on a massive scale, mortgage paper, on a massive scale and as an innovation in which it announced it will not stop buying at a rate of $40 billion a year until the unemployment rate reaches, they didn't say a number, but it's widely thought to be, to be 7%. So they've promised to just keep flooding the money, the markets with money, until they succeed in uh, bringing uh, unemployment down and uh, to uh, a uh, reasonable level. The ECB's promise relates to the difficulties of some of the states in, uh, in raising money because of uh, weaknesses in their financial system. Uh, in, in, their, uh, in their economies, but also because, uh, the, uh, because there's a fear that the, uh, they will not be able to stay uh, in the Eurozone, and they've agreed to do that. The, uh, European, the United Kingdom government has been buying government bonds on a massive scale. It's now introduced the Funding for Lending program and almost every central bank is providing funding in some way or the other to help the banks uh, stay in operation. Well, did all this work? The answer is, is I think, yes. Uh, there is a reading list which will be made available on the website for this uh, lecture, and there's a very good uh, article by, uh, lecture by Ben Bernanke at the Jackson Hole Conference in uh, actually early September this year, laying out the evidence that these unconventional measures work. There's also a very nice Bank of England paper uh, referred to in the reading list where they find, they claim that the Bank of England's actions have reduced long-term government rates by uh, 100 basis points, that is by 1%. That's a very large amount. So this stuff seems to work. So we've learned you can do more even when the interest rate is zero. Furthermore, uh, there's a way of describing some of what's being done, and that is that we used to refer to the central bank as the lender of last resort. When there's a crisis, when the markets are short of liquidity, uh, when it looks like institutions are going to collapse, the central bank can go in and buy up assets, paper. And uh, you can go back in monetary history to the 19th century, central banks understood that. The central bank, which historically is the Bank of England, uh, did that uh, frequently during uh, crises. And some, I, I must pass on one, uh, one lesson of experience. As a central banker, I think I've learned as much from studying the history of central banking as I have from knowing the theory of central banking. And I advise all of you who want to be central bankers to actually read the history books. Turns out our predecessors had to deal with problems which are not, not that dissimilar, although the scale is a bit different, uh, from those uh, we're, uh, we're, we've had to deal with uh, recently. So the central bank is well known as the lender of last resort. That's where you go when nobody else is willing to give credit. And it is now also understood to be the market maker of last resort. When an important market in the financial system collapses, the central bank can go into that market and restore it uh, to operation. And that's what central banks have been doing uh, during this crisis. Um, 
In the uh, reading list, there is material, uh, including a, a lecture by Mervyn King on inflation targeting, which is the basic approach to monetary policy today. Uh, I will raise at the end the issue well, let me say very quickly what I want to say. Here I'm going to go too fast and I apologize, but uh, I want to, want to get it down. Um, the basic approach to monetary policy lately has been flexible inflation targeting. What does it mean? It means you have a target for inflation. In the UK, it's 2%. Uh, the, U the US is gradually introducing a 2% target. We have a 1% to 3% target, which I think is slightly better because I don't feel we can control the interest, the inflation rate to within uh, very accurately in an economy which is buffeted by, uh, by exchange rate movements which arise from abroad. The flexible in inflation targeting is that if, as long as inflation is in the target range, uh, you may deal with other issues including uh, dealing with unemployment and output. And uh, we've certainly done that. I think, in fact, no central bank has ever targeted only inflation. I think they say they target inflation. But I am quite sure that if, as happened in the UK uh, recently, the inflation rate was 4% and the economy was in a deep recession, the central bank would not think of that in the same way as it would with 4% inflation in the economy growing uh, and with uh, low unemployment. Uh, so I think they always do, they always have, uh, but you need to have that inflation target firmly in mind. Uh, you can extend flexible inflation targeting to trying to preserve the financial system and the credit system. That is, you can do it, you can look at that target uh, as well uh, and not only at the inflation target. So what is the bottom line on monetary policy? Well, I think it is that central banks have done heroic things in this uh, crisis. Um, for this, they are often criticized, especially in the United States, but sometimes the United Kingdom. And for this, they, and I'm not talking about us, we're a small central bank, they deserve our gratitude, uh, and my view is that if uh, Ben Bernanke had not been around, the world would be, uh, had not been around and had not known what he knew, the uh, world economy would be in significantly worse shape uh, today uh, than it is. Let me turn now to the part of, uh, of, the, of economic policy and this, and this crisis of which we knew uh, but didn't really include in very much of what we uh, said and what we uh, taught. And that is the issue of uh, financial stability. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move ahead. Uh, if you look at what happened to stock markets just in the quarter from the end of 2008 to, uh, from the end of September, from September 2008 to, to the end of 2008, you'll see massive declines in stock markets. Russia declining by nearly 50%. Even uh, Norway, which is uh, held out as a paradigm of good behavior, declining by nearly 30%, and so on, and many of them declining by 20%. The crisis hit the capital markets very, very uh, severely. More interestingly, it hit the emerging market capital markets very severely. What you see here is how the emerging market capital markets, the purple, uh, how they just shot ahead in the period between 2005 to 2007. Then came Bear Stearns, then came Lehman Brothers, and by then they were back way down to the same levels relative to 2005 as uh, the Europeans and uh, the United States. But they recovered much more quickly. Once again, emerging markets uh, doing better. Now, these things uh, happened, and uh, I'm going to go back just to rest here. 
Um, the key, if you want to read a book or if you only want to read an article, the key thing you ought to read on financial stability is a book by uh, Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoth uh, called This Time is Different. And it was published in 2009. The work on it was done before the crisis. Um, this Time is Different is what people say every time they get into a situation where the, you see bubbles developing in the uh, capital markets. This time it's different. We understand better, the analysts are better, the risk is laid off somewhere else, and so forth. That's the uh, story. I tell my uh, colleagues in Israel that we have another version of this. Uh, this country is different. Yeah, that's how it works in the rest of the world, but here, believe me, it doesn't happen. Well, it does happen, and this time isn't different, and this country isn't different. When things when asset prices start rising too fast, you're going to pay a high price unless you're very, very careful. And the key lesson that comes out of Reinhardt and Rogoff's book, which is based on eight centuries of data, is that a recession accompanied by a financial crisis is likely to be significantly longer and significantly deeper than a normal recession. We sort of knew that. And those of us in the IMF learned it even more in the 1990s when the Asian cri cri countries got into financial crises and severe uh, recessions. But it wasn't internalized adequately. This crisis was set off by a massive financial crisis in the United States, which started in 2007 as the subprime crisis and which finally became evident to the entire world on a particular day, September the 15th, 2008, when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. And at that point, the entire world understood that it was in a severe financial crisis, and those other things I told you about trade declining uh, and uh, what you saw about capital markets uh, is... Uh, is what happened. Now these crises can be very costly and they can increase your debt enormously. Here we have the uh, costliest banking crises since 1970 uh, and if you uh, look at them you'll see that the uh, Irish, uh, where are we, that the Iceland crisis in uh, Iceland crisis in 2008 cost 44% of GDP to the government. That's nearly half a year's output. That's massive. You see uh, Chile and uh, others up there, and there are enormous increases in the government debt associated with that. Now, these are a bunch of countries which you might say, well, you know, they're not very important. All countries are important, but here's one which is closer to the countries uh, that uh, are more developed and that are more uh, in the news. You see that the Iceland crisis is still there, 44% increase in debt. Ireland, 42% uh, uh, increase. Uh, uh, f this is the fiscal cost, sorry, this is what it costs the government. Uh, and so on. Incidentally, the number for Israel is wrong. I have no idea why. I, I decided not to correct it because this is, in fact, taken from the IMF, but it's wrong. It didn't happen in 1977. It happened in 1983, for one thing. Uh, and then you see others. Finland had a big crisis. The UK looks relatively small, 10% of GDP, and it goes down. But these things can be massively expensive and massively difficult to get out of. And then the question is, what do you do? Um, and uh, this is where we have to ask what's been going on. How, how are we going to uh, prevent this happening again? So you have two choices. You have to do two things. One is do everything you can to prevent them. And the second is when you see a banking crisis, you better deal with it quickly. There's a great temptation to sort of say, 
drag it along. And the longer you drag it along, the bigger the cost is going to be in the end. And you have to deal with them very quickly and sometimes quite brutally. Uh, there's a set of principles for dealing with failing banks, uh, which uh, we won't go through uh, right now. So um, there's a series of uh, lessons that have been learned and things that are going on that need to uh, be studied, and I will mention them, but unfortunately we don't have time to go into them uh, in detail. Number one, banks need higher and better quality capital. Second, the system needs to be less levered, that is, it needs more uh, liquidity in the system, and you don't want banks operating on very fine liquidity uh, amounts of liquidity and relying on markets to give them loans when they get into trouble because when they all get into trouble together nobody gives them uh, loans. There's an enormous need to improve corporate governance in the banking system including uh, including uh, the incentives that are given to traders. There has to be a way of dealing with what the trade now calls TBTF, too big to fail. Uh, when you decide that a large bank is too big to fail, you change the way that bank behaves if it knows it's too big to fail, and they do. And it will take more risks, and it knows it can, in the end, go, put itself on the mercy uh, of the government. So we have to find ways of preventing that. There are things, banks, called SIFIs, systemically important financial institutions, not only banks, and it needs to be possible to resolve their difficulties quickly, which probably means putting them into bankruptcy and dealing with them quickly, and at a minimum cost to the economy, and at no cost, if possible, to taxpayers. All those things need to be done. And then there are the issues which have been raised by Paul Volcker in the United States, and uh, which is uh, central in the Vickers report uh, on the combination of investment banking and, uh, and commercial banking. I worked for several years in a commercial bank, which is also an investment bank. Uh, I think the culture of the investment bank polluted the commercial bank culture. Uh, you have one part of the bank where somebody who makes a million dollars a year uh, is very highly paid. And you meet another part of the bank where somebody who makes, who's highly paid is making $20 million a year. That's the investment bank. Those two cultures don't exactly work together. Um, now I know that I'm saying something which is not, not this is controversial, it's not fully agreed by everyone. But I believe there has to be a way of separating the cultures, and I, uh, John Vickers has uh, proposed ring, fest, ring fencing the traditional, traditional banking activities, not necessarily separating the companies entirely, but making sure that the, the uh, commercial banking activities or the traditional banking activities cannot be uh, driven into bankruptcy if something goes wrong in the uh, rest of the uh, banking system, in, in the rest of the bank. There has been an enormous amount of work done, and it's ongoing, by the Basel Committee, which uh, is uh, resident in the Bank for International Settlements, they're not formally part of it, uh, which has produced so-called Basel III, a new set of regulations, designed to deal with um, the difficulties which, or the desire, the uh, goals which I've uh, outlined. The financial stability uh, uh, forum which existed before this crisis became the Financial Stability Board. It has a much uh, stronger mandate. It's part, it relates to the uh, G20 it has come out with a blizzard. Both of them have come out with blizzards of regulations. You read each of their papers and you're very, I think they do very high quality work. Uh, and we read the FSB uh, re reports uh, and they reach out to the smaller countries like ours. And uh, I think that 
what is being done is important. There is is important and essential. There was recently a paper from uh, the Bank of England which I regard as a creed de coeur rather than uh, more than that, which is called The Dog and the Frisbee. Uh, it's a, a paper by Andy Haldane of the Bank of England uh, saying, look, you know, dogs catch frisbees and you can describe what they're doing. They're minimizing the angle between something and something else as they chase uh, chase this ball and you only need one prin uh, this frisbee, you only need that principle to catch the frisbee. And surely we can go back to something more simple than the stuff that is coming out of the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board. Well, I think that's something we'd all love. Just imagine there were only three things you had to tell them, more capital, more liquidity, and uh, and something about uh, the incentives for risk taking within the firm. That would be great. But that was actually the approach of Basel I, was principles, not detailed regulations. And unfortunately, uh, all regulatory uh, er, thing, uh, uh, all regulatory activities in the financial sector are a game, not in the sense of cricket. Uh, in the sense of some other game, uh, in the sense of a, uh, a, 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 macro, a, a, a game in economics between the regulator and the, uh, and the uh, regulatee. And uh, typically, uh, they become very complicated and you have to try to deal with the complexities. Any case, final thing, and then I'll go on to, I get to the end. We what has also been learned, this is all about regulating banks and so forth and financial institutions. What has also been learned is something called macro prudential regulation and supervision. What happened in Lehman? The regulators did not understand the connections between Lehman Brothers and the rest of the financial system. Before it happened, uh, there was a buzz going around well, Lehman is a relatively small bank, or medium-sized bank, uh, so it doesn't really matter. Well, turned out you pulled Lehman out of that jigsaw puzzle, and it really did matter, much more than its relative size mattered. And it set off a chain reaction of, uh, of, of difficulties uh, that, whose consequences we're dealing with today, so it seems. Um, so we now have invented the field of macroprudential regulation where we're supposed to look at systemic interactions between uh, companies, between financial institutions, and supervise the financial system as a whole, not individual institutions. That's a new field, that's a new discovery, that's not in Keynes, that wasn't in what we taught our students, it wasn't in what we did very much, uh, and it's new, it's being developed, it's far from being uh, finalized. But it has to be done, and it has to be strengthened, and we're all trying to do that. I uh, wrote, for those of you who've looked at the outline, uh, some questions uh, and issues, and I'm not going to go through all of them because we're running out of time, but I would like to talk uh, about uh, two of them, or three of them. First, the impact of these extraordinary measures undertaken by the central banks on the independence of central banks. As long as our job was conceived as controlling inflation, that was relatively uh, straightforward. And everybody accepted that the central banks should be independent. Now you're getting into situations, I'll tell you what we've done macroprudentially, we've had to, in the Bank of Israel and many other central banks, have had to intervene in mortgage markets. We've reduced the loan-to-value ratios that people can take. Why? Because we thought housing prices were rising too rapidly. Singapore has done that, Hong Kong has done that, Norway has done it, Australia has done it, etc. This is very common. Well, the difference in the noise one hears when one raises the uh, interest rate and the noise one hears when, quote, you prevent young couples from buying apartments, uh, which is a very exaggerated description of what happens when you reduce loan-to-value ratios. 
they're two totally different things. These detailed interventions are much more politically controversial. And uh, I believe they're going to have some impact somewhere down the road, or they could, unless we uh, develop better uh, understanding among the public of why we're doing what we're doing. I believe that otherwise it could have an impact on the central bank's independence and in general this wide range of activities that central banks have taken on themselves could conceivably lead to some political uh, reaction which could impact central bank independence. Um, I wrote down a question, can governments do what has to be done to deal with a massive crisis? I think they can do it once the crisis starts, but it would be much better if they can do what has to be done to prevent a massive crisis. That's harder, and let me explain why, because the, I'll give you the example of Australia. Australia has run exemplary fiscal policies. Its national debt is approximately zero. They've just run budget surpluses and they've grown very fast and the ratio of debt to GDP is actually about 10%, but that's as close to zero as anybody could want. Came the crisis, the Australians increased government spending massively. Why? They didn't have to worry about the debt. It got up to somewhere like 30 or 35% and they stopped. No problem with debt that small. So in order to be able to prevent, you've got to be in a position to undertake measures when the crisis comes that will enable you to deal with it. That means getting yourself into shape before the crisis. It means running more conservative fiscal policies than we've been used to thinking uh, could be run. It means we have to have to be much more uh, aware of the financial risks that are taking place. Will that happen? Well, you have the contest between the electoral cycle and uh, the need to deal with future crises. And as soon as the pressure is off in terms of uh, financing, you may find yourself uh, with governments which, for reasons that are understandable, do not want to uh, undertake difficult measures that might be uh, necessary uh, in future at much lower cost than uh, they would be faced with if uh, they do what is convenient uh, in the short run. This is a very difficult issue. There are many attempts to introduce fiscal rules, fiscal laws uh, to try and induce good behavior but in the end, uh, it is the governments, governments regard their main function when they're not uh, in uh, military problems as being the budget. And uh, the more you try to constrain it, the less likely they are to like that, and that's a fact, and we have to figure out ways of doing that uh, efficiently. Um, I will not talk about uh, whether the center of gravity well, I will talk about whether the center of gravity of the global economy is moving to Asia. It is. Uh, the share of global GDP produced in Asia has re is rising all the time. And it continues to rise because those countries are growing more rapidly than the rest of the world. And this restores a situation which existed 200 years ago before the rise, the economic rise uh, of the West. Uh, the question is whether the rest of the world can make the accommodations to that. And I think there's an extra question, whether the new countries can take over the responsibilities that the old countries took on themselves uh, to run the global economy. The global economy in which we work is a creation of World War II and its aftermath. It was created in conscious recognition of the need to avoid what had happened in the 1930s. And a lot of the measures there are designed for that. It, rec it promotes trade liberalization very strongly. Why? Because the volume of trade at the end of World War II was 4% of world GDP. It is now about 40%, uh, 35% of, of GDP. Trade was destroyed by the 1930s and by World War II. 
That's been an engine of growth throughout. The United States promoted free trade. It was relatively open throughout this period. I know that everybody has their complaints, Boeing versus Airbus and all that sort of stuff. The basic line is that it was a very open economy and accepted imports from the rest of the world, which helped the world grow. Question is whether the new countries are going to ease into a position like that or whether it will remain very difficult for them. But we do need to have the world economy operated by either, either a hegemon, which was the United States, and which will probably no longer be the United States, or a group of countries operating that way to ensure that the rules under which we operate are, are ones which are conducive to the economic health of the entire world. Uh, we know roughly what those rules are. They're embodied in the uh, Articles of Agreement of the major international institutions, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank. One hopes that as the world moves, as the center of the world moves to the G20, away from the G7, that those basic principles will be maintained and that the lessons we have learned from this crisis, particularly with regard to the need to ensure the stability of the financial sector, will be learned and implemented. Thank you very much. Professor Fisher has done, I think, an extraordinary job distilling clear lessons from complexity of the world crisis. Indeed, I, I don't feel like I've understood macroeconomics this well since I was in graduate school. Uh, we have time for a few questions, and following the questions, we have a public reception somewhere to be revealed in this building. So um, Louise knows where it is. But in any case, um, if you have questions, raise your hand, and I will recognize you, and then Louise will give you one of the microphones so you can be heard. Sorry, gentleman back there. You didn't, say anything, you didn't say anything in your talk about the interaction of theory through the crisis. What did, what, did, what did macroeconomic theory tell us about the crisis going in and out of it? In particular, I'm thinking of the more maybe analytic tools like dynamic, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Or at, to what extent were we arguing through analogy versus through more precise uh, mathematical tools. Well, I, and what was the success? Well, the success was very low in, in light of what happened. Um, this crisis was not unforeseen by anyone. Uh, there were people who saw it uh, coming, and, and uh, you know who they were on the reading list is a uh, particularly perceptive article by Raghu Rajan, who at the time was the chief economist at the IMF, saying something, I forget the title, but it's something like, uh, has financial development made the world a safer place? To which his answer, very politely, is probably not. But he doesn't, say, he doesn't quite say that. I think the, uh, the formal, I don't think the formal theory we had contributed a great deal to dealing with this, uh, with this situation. There are aspects of the financial system that you understand through uh, parts of, of finance theory. Uh, DSGE models, uh, we, we use them, they're useful, um, but I don't think that at the state, in the state they were, which left out the financial system by and large, uh, that we learned a whole lot from them, I wish we had. Everyone is trying now to get, put financial systems into those models in a way that uh, makes sense. Uh, but the difficulty is those models, you have to put something in which enables crises to happen. And those models are full of people who are making rational decisions and uh, optimizing and so forth. Uh, so getting the problems into the models is essential and not, not easy.
100% of the GDP, Japan, Japan's national debt. Why is it so gigantic? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a little, it's like 250 or a bit more percent of GDP. It's because Japan has been running very large deficits since the 1990s, trying to run fiscal policy, expansionary fiscal policy, and growth has been low. So as the debt piles up every year because of the large deficit, it's not being reduced relative to GDP uh, by growth. And um, they can do it because the interest rate is so low. Uh, so the amount of interest they pay even on that enormous debt is low. Um, but Japanese are concerned that one day that interest rate will rise and put their budget in a very difficult situation, even more difficult than the current. Hi. Uh, you did talk about the uh, investment banking culture as uh, opposed to commercial banking. And uh, over the years, we've seen some of the banks cutting back on their investment banking uh, platform. So I'm afraid uh, some of those investment bankers might find their way through the commercial banks. Don't you think maybe that might create some problem whereby they might be taking excessive risk that might uh, maybe put us in some troubles? Because I've actually worked in uh, banking in the U.S., and we have both a commercial and investment banking uh, platform. And sometimes there are some, uh, you know, uh, somewhat uh, disagreements or conflicts of interest within the banks. So is, it, is there anything that can be done to address that with the banks? Well, I think um, those issues are the issues which were reviewed in the, uh, I, I don't know what the official title of the Vickers report is, but, um, and uh, there, is a w there is a way of trying to keep the uh, commercial banking activities separated from the investment banking. I mean, the, the, the problem when you combine the balance sheets is that you're then taking deposit money and letting the deposit money be used uh, for activities that are uh, probably not conducive to uh, being the other side of the balance sheet from deposits. So. Uh, that's a fundamental problem which is dealt with in, uh, in the Vickers ring fencing proposals. You briefly discussed inflation targeting. I was just wondering what your opinion is on other potential monetary policy rules uh, such as price level targeting or nominal GDP or something like that. Well, there's an argument in the literature about price level targeting, uh, which uh, under some stochastic processes for inflation, it, my concern about price level targeting is you bring in negative feedback because when you go above, when your inflation rate is, is above target, you have to cut it down to below the average thereafter. Now, you have stochastic processes in which that isn't fully true, but I, I don't like it, uh, and uh, Lars Svensson of uh, the Swedish uh, Riksbank and also some time of, of Princeton uh, has insisted that it's a good approach. I, I prefer what we have now. Uh, secondly, on nominal GDP targeting, I actually got a paper from some graduate student explaining that we'd been doing nominal GDP targeting in Israel, and that's why it had worked. Well, we didn't know we were doing nominal GDP targeting, uh, and I looked at the data and I realized what had happened. There was a period at the beginning of the crisis when our inflation rate was uh, above target, mainly because of housing prices, and growth was negative. So if you put the two of them together, you got nominal GDP growing fairly fast. I mean, more or less at the steady rate. But there was nothing conscious about doing it that way. And uh, I think the practical problems of the nominal GDP targeting are very severe. The fact that those data are revised ex post significantly means you do something on day one and uh, turns out that when the final data come out, your monetary policy should have been different just for the data reason. I mean, frequently your understanding of what was going on in the economy changes 
and you realize you should have done something different, but just to be basing it on wrong data seems to me to be problematic. So not yet uh, in favor of it, but who knows. In the New York Times, Paul Krugman in the New York Times, where he said that debt is just money that we owe ourselves. He, he described debt as money that we owe ourselves yes. in, a, in the US, for example. And you talked about debt as being important and for its effect on growth. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about those two aspects. Well, the, the, the argument that debt is money we owe ourselves is, is uh, by and large true. It's not true in the United States where significant parts of the debt are held, uh, are held uh, abroad and certainly of the, uh, you know, we say the Chinese hold dollars, they actually hold treasury bills, which is US government debt. Uh, and everybody's reserves are in, in market, they're, they're not in dollar bills. Uh, so the world's reserve, dollar reserves are held in, uh, in, in, in paper of the government. So that argument isn't fully true. Also, there's a dead weight loss associated with, because the tax system isn't perfect and so forth, uh, you know, it's not, it's the servicing of the debt requires the imposition of taxes and uh, taxation causes losses, dead weight losses, uh, welfare losses. So it, you know, that's, that, I have great respect for Paul Kruger to be clear on that, but uh, I don't think that's an especially uh, good argument. By the way, for the gentleman with alternative monetary policies, I think one of the really interesting cases is Singapore, which operates uh, basically using the exchange rate as its main uh, mechanism. and. It targets the exchange rate, and it adjusts the target. Uh, and the exchange rate is more important than the interest rate. They take the interest rate that comes with the exchange rate. And that's one that I don't think we understand well enough. It works. <laughs>